Well, let's get started. Uh, welcome to the Delaware CTR Excel Innovative Discovery Series. Uh, first, some housekeeping. Uh, will the online participants uh, please keep your mics muted unless you're asking a question? And those of you in the room, lower the volume of your cell phones. Make sure you sign in. Use the chat feature in blue jeans if you have a technical question. You're not in the room. Uh, previous presentations are available on the Delaware CTR website. Next week, there is no presentation, but the following week on October 9th, <coughs> there is a talk of one of our favorite topics, the human gut microbiome. And the following week, there's a talk on creating health literate organizations. For those of you who are not make, able to make it into Philadelphia to listen to the Pope, you will not be disappointed. We have a really good talk today. Talking about has some holes. Dr. Tim Grinnell got his PhD from Penn State in Ecology. He is the director for the Center of Pediatric, Auditory, and Speech Sciences at Memorial. He's also the director of the Bioinformatics Core Facility at Memorial. He's an adjunct professor in the Department of Computer and Information Sciences at University of Delaware, as well as a research associate professor in the Department of Linguistics at the University of Delaware. He is the PI or co-PI on many NIH, FOREA, or other grants, the author and co-author of many dozens of publications, as well as the editor or reviewer of several journals. The topic today is, Why Must My Child Sound Like Stephen Hawking? Personalized Synthetic Voices for Pediatric Assistive Communication. Rick, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to sort of go for breadth today, given the, the sort of mixed audience that we have, rather than depth, although from time to time we will have to dive down into the weeds a little bit just to be sure that I know the terminology is being understood. Um, I'm going to be talking first about augmentative communication in general. and. Um, the patients who are served and the sort of technology that's available for augmentative communication. Then we're going to shift gears completely and talk about speech synthesis as a, as a technology itself and go into that for a little bit and finally talk about some of the voice banking and uh, personalized speech synthesis work that my lab has been doing now for a number of years. Um, so starting out with AAC users. Uh, um, they are, by and large, a group of people whose speech deficit is too severe to allow them to, uh, to be understood by strangers when they try to speak orally to them. Um, estimates are very wide ranging. I've not found, and I look about every year for a good fixed uh, definition of how many uh, AAC users there are in the U.S. or worldwide, <coughs> and the estimates range from, in this case, a low of uh, 500,000 to 3.5 million in the U.S. Um, these are based on differences in the way that people actually come up with their estimates. Uh, the people served are primarily folks with cerebral palsy, um, ALS patients, stroke, traumatic brain injury, multiple sclerosis, uh, Parkinson's, and a few other diseases. Uh, one thing that we do have a better fix on is that at least in the U.S. there's 11 to 12,000 augmentative communication devices sold per year. So that gives us some estimate of the amount of uh, technology that's flowing out to the public. Um, the majority of the AAC users have more than just their voice involved, so that in addition to, uh, to not being able to speak fluently to some degree of dysarthria or aphonia, they uh, typically are unable to do fine motor skills, so typing is not an option for the majority of uh, of patients, often they're wheelchair bound as well. Um, so AAC devices are um, broadly devices that are intended to support any form of communication except oral human speech. Um, early on, devices such as the term um, means were 
uh, primarily things like communication boards where there was literally a, a piece of wood with a batch of pictures on it and people would point to the pictures to indicate what they were trying to say or the picture and the pictures would typically be some form of grammatical symbol that allowed folks to structure a sort of a language from that symbol sequence. Um, current devices are almost entirely, and I guess I should say entirely, based on uh, computer technology. Uh, they support a variety of input methods, uh, including uh, touch or key press, uh, scanning the device to uh, find a particular event and clicking a single switch to trigger that event, uh, or using eye gaze to fixate a particular place and having that serve as the input mechanism. Um, most of the devices these days output synthetic speech or possibly uh, recorded natural speech. Um, and because of the speech output from devices these days, they're often now referred to as speech generating devices <coughs> rather than augmentative communication devices. Um, so here's an example of some of the sorts of devices that, uh, um, that we have. This is a communication <coughs> device by a company called Dynavox. Uh, Dynavox, as a, an individual company, is no more. They've now joined forces with another company called Toby. This is an extremely small and competitive market where it's very hard for companies to survive. Um, but Dynavox, uh, this device you can see is actually intended for typing. It has fairly large keys that are touch sensitive and you, you type them in and you end up typing words and the words form sentences and at some point you press a play button and out comes a synthesized utterance. Um, here's another form of device where um, uh, instead of having a standard keyboard layout, you actually have a set of pictograms, and uh, some of the pictures might translate to single words or to phrases. Uh, there's a grammatical sequence in which the pictures can be combined to produce uh, output. And I believe this, this device is also an eye gaze based system, so that the combination of this area up here and, and this thing down at the bottom uh, allows an individual sitting in front of the device to actually stare at a particular key and if they're able to fixate that key steadily for a long enough period of time, it activates the key. Um, finally, uh, yet another device that's <coughs> on the market these days is a, uh, an, a communication device for an iPad. This happens to be a product called uh, uh, Predictable from a company called Therapy Box. Um, and I also put this one up to illustrate the way scanning works because this is the way uh, some communicators, including Stephen Hawking, actually use their communication device. You'll notice that there's a, a highlighted row of letters here. That highlighting will be scanning over every possible row on the device. When it crosses a row that has a letter or key you want to type, you click a single switch and it stops scanning the rows and it starts scanning the columns. And when it gets to the letter within that row that you want to type, you click again and that causes that particular key to be pressed. Uh, you can imagine that it takes Stephen Hawking quite a while to write a book using that sort of technology. Two clicks per letter. However, you'll notice also that there are some words up above the uh, keyboard here. And what this device and many devices now do as well is they use word prediction. So that if you type a T, the most likely word you're going to be typing is the. And so that'll be one of the early choices in your list. And, and after you've typed the full word, it will use uh, a bigram or a trigram grammar of the language to try and predict whole words that you might use next so that the, the, uh, the typing can be sped up at least somewhat by the, the word prediction system on the device. Unfortunately, cognitive load for word prediction turns out to be fairly high. So um, although there's a lot of, uh, of redundancy in language and it shows up in the word prediction, uh, switching back and forth between looking at what words have been predicted and trying to manually operate the keyboard uh, requires a lot of task switching. And that actually makes the communication rate a lot slower than, um, <coughs> than it might otherwise be. <coughs> so, my title sort of suggested we were going to hear something from Stephen Hawking, and so I guess we, we better head. Right in the center of the Milky Way, 26,000 light years from us, lies the heaviest object in the entire galaxy. So, um, that voice was one 
of a small number of voices that was on the original communication device that Stephen Hawking started using now many years ago. Um, interestingly, that device broke, and probably the device after that broke, and he's actually had to invest a fair amount of money into getting people to replicate the sound of that particular synthetic voice as he goes from device to device, so that he still has his voice. And many of us now, when we listen to synthetic voices, would hear that and think, Stephen Hawking. <coughs> and as I just said, however, if we take that upper estimate of several million people in the country who need communication devices, um, it, it's clear that we're going to need several million more voices if we don't want everybody just using Stephen Hawking's voice. So what does the, the voice situation look like in communication devices today? Well, this, this chart is actually a, a couple years old now, I think. But at the time, surveying the communication devices that were available and widely used, um, I came up with these different companies, DeckTalk, Nuance, Evona, AT&T, Acapella, uh, who were making voices that were shipped on some augmentative communication devices, totaling up all the voices that might be available, and no one device includes all of these voices. You can see that we've got 23 <coughs> adult female voices, um, a, a nearly equal number of adult male voices, six children's voices, whoops, excuse me, and one chipmunk in case. Chipmunk. <laughs> um, so just to summarize the, the um, the section about augmentative communication here. Uh, speech generating devices obviously are playing a central role. We can see the way Stephen Hawking identifies with his, his voice. Um, they afford users, the, uh, the devices on the market afford users only a small selection of possible sort of generic voices that they can choose from. Um, and so the, the voice that you end up with in your communication device may be your only voice, but it's not your own voice. It's just another voice that people use. And it kind of serves to uh, depersonalize the user. They're, they're not an individual. They're just a, you know something behind a black box. Um, so our uh, ideal would be to be able to provide every child who's using a communication device, or adult for that matter, a unique voice that's actually their own and that would be recognized as their own. And in order to do that, we need to make a lot of improvements to the way text-to-speech systems. So that's sort of my next topic there. Now, I'm going to give you a sort of a two-dimensional breakdown into, into how speech synthesis systems are, are designed and constructed. Um, we can start by, by thinking in terms of systems that are either parametric or concatenative. By parametric, I mean that the speech synthesizer works by having a set of parameters that it uses to generate audio waveforms. And those parameters are used to describe the structure of speech and how speech changes over time. Concatenative systems, rather than storing parameters, actually store speech. And when they go to present speech, they do so by concatenating little bits and pieces of recorded speech. Now, at the extreme kludgy end of that, you have the systems that tell you what time it is in, in the 60s, where it would say the time is now five, two, three, six, whatever. Um, Obviously, concatenative synthesis is a lot more sophisticated than that, but that's basically the idea. You have some recordings of speech, and you paste them together to form a, a longer utterance. On the other dimension, uh, we have systems that are constructed basically by experts uh, using rules that they design or bits of speech that somebody who really knows acoustic phonetics extracts from waveforms, cuts and pastes into, uh, into the system. Or we have database systems where we're using some kind of machine learning algorithm to actually derive the rules or the units that we're going to concatenate. So that's the general breakdown. Now, if we look more specifically at some of the different types of systems, um, the parametric knowledge-based systems are the sort of old line uh, things. 
where the parameter trajectories are programmed by an expert. And we'll go into some examples of this in a minute. Uh, but Stephen Hawking's voice in a, in a, a system called Deck Talk are good examples of this. Um, historically, those were about the earliest synthetic voices that we had. And then uh, diphone synthesis came along. It was actually first conceptualized in the 50s, but didn't really get used until the 70s when computer technology caught up to the ability to be able to store and manipulate uh, chunks of stored speech. Um, and there we cut speech up into what are called diphones, and I'll go into that uh, in a moment as well. And some of the early uh, better sounding speech synthesis systems, um, including a system that came on Macs years ago called Macintalk, and uh, some of the early systems from AT&T and Bell Labs were also uh, diphone synthesis systems. Um, the next step after that was actually sort of an extension of <coughs> diphone synthesis, where now, rather than having an expert cut and paste diphones and, and form a library of them uh, by hand, we have machines that are, that are rummaging through recordings of speech to find the units that we want to record. And on top of that, we're extending from not having a single diphone, but to having a whole massive collection of diphones for each phonetic sequence that we want. Uh, something that could only be practical from a machine learning standpoint because of the massive number of units that would be involved in the process. And uh, lastly, we're now, and this is sort of the cutting edge of speech synthesis technology, we're now in the process of looking at how we can use machine learning to learn the parameter trajectories that used to be designed by experts and use those to synthesize speech from uh, starting with a database of, of recorded speech. So let's talk a little bit about um, the, uh, the early part of speech synthesis. <coughs> but in order to do that, I'm actually going to need to dive down into the weeds a little bit further and talk some about acoustic phonetics. Uh, this is a speech uh, waveform displayed on a, a waveform display that we commonly use in the laboratory. Uh, it is actually a single word recorded, and it sounds like this. Stop. Um, you can see that, that the, um, the machine, well, you probably can't see this, but I'll tell you, the, uh, the um, x-axis in this diagram is time, so it, it goes from the left edge of the display to the right edge of the play, display. The first region here that you see this is a, an S sound. There's a silent interval here corresponding to the stop of the T, and then a vowel, which has this sort of periodic pattern to it another silent interval and a little bit of a burst at the end that's the release of the P at the end of stop. Um, so this is a waveform display, <coughs> one way of looking at speech. We can also look at the, uh, at the spectrum of speech, and this is a, a frequency display where what we're seeing here is a frequency axis uh, that shows us, uh, this is in, in hertz or cycles per second, so we see a spectrum from zero to 8,000 hertz. And the, uh, the y-axis is an energy measure. This is in decibels. Um, and you can see the characteristic of an S. We have the majority of the energy in a peak in, in higher than 4,000 hertz here. So that's characteristic of an S, where it's got a lot of fairly high frequency information and much less low frequency information. Here is uh, the spectrum of the vowel sound, and um, notice that unlike the S, it now has sort of a regular ripple pattern in the spectrum. Those ripples are actually called harmonics, and they're related to the fundamental frequency of the talker. The lower the fundamental frequency, the closer those harmonics are together, and the higher the fundamental frequency, the further apart the harmonics are. So this is, this is the way speech is displayed, both in terms of a waveform and uh, in terms of its spectra. Um, but to understand how we go about doing synthesis, I need to take one more step and talk about something that's called source filter theory. So I, I showed you a couple of those spectra. Um, now we're going to break those spectra down into two separable components. One of them is due to the sound that's produced here in your glottis. It's a sort of a buzzing sound that's, that is, at least for voiced sounds like vowels, the fundamental frequency of your voice. And I've drawn a picture of that as, as is typical for speech in the top panel here. 
Um, this would correspond to a talker who has a, a male voice, about 100 hertz fundamental frequency, and the, the slope of the, of the spectrum is typical of a male voice as well. In the middle panel, we have uh, what's sometimes called the vocal tract response function. What happens when you produce that phonation or buzzing sound at the glottis is the, the sound waves echo back and forth in your vocal tract and some uh, waves are reinforced and they resonate and other pattern, other frequencies are not reinforced and they don't resonate. Uh, the places where there are peaks in this middle graph are the places where the vocal tract is resonating to the sound that's produced at the glottis. And that produces concentrations of energy that we often call formants. And those are the things that are responsible for um, how particular vowels actually sound to us. Now, the interesting thing is that when you drive that source function from the glottis through the vocal tract, the output <coughs> looks, at least in the log domain, as though it's the sum of these two separate functions. So it's kind of nice and separable that way. You can see both the the very fine pattern that's associated with the harmonics of the source function and the broader peaks that are actually associated with the harmonic or with the resonances or formants of the vocal tract. Um, now what happens, of course, this is a single spectral cross section, so it, in, it corresponds to an <coughs> instant in time in the middle of the vowel somewhere. In reality, when we're talking, our mouth is constantly changing. Our vocal folds are constantly vibrating at different pitches as we go. The intonation rises and falls, and, and those things all have an effect on this. So this pattern that we've captured here for one instant is actually a constantly changing pattern over time in real speech. And the problem for somebody who's designing a speech synthesizer is how do I um, represent that constantly changing pattern in time? So here's one way. This is the old way, the way that was done with Deck Talk and the way that is done in Stephen Hawking's voice. Um, and now I don't expect you to read this script over here, but what it amounts to is essentially a little program. And that program tells the parameters of the formant synthesizer, in this case the resonant frequencies and the fundamental frequency and the amplitude and all the features that it needs, how to behave for successive moments in time. And so there's a time axis, you can see little time things here, and then at different times, different parameter settings. And you go to the trouble of putting this together and you feed that program through a system that understands it and out comes something amazing like this. Uh. <laughs> Not a lot. Uh, if you were gonna produce an entire sentence that way, imagine the amount of time and energy it would take. Well. For Stephen Hawking synthesizer, every phoneme has a little script like this, and then above that layer of scripts, there's another layer of scripts that says how you combine these things so that they blend smoothly in time. And then above that layer of scripts is a third layer of scripts that says if I'm producing an entire utterance, I need to start higher at the beginning and then lower at the end unless it's a question when I need to write it at the end, and a whole lot of prosodic and timing factors that go into it. So it's a very complicated cascade of one rule system governing another rule system governing another rule system. And only an expert can put something together like that and actually produce speech that's understandable. And there have only been a few experts really in the, in the world who have done that consistently, and, and those show up in voices like the one that Stephen Hawking is using, and the, the other major system is something called Tech Talk that uses a system that Dennis Cladden <coughs> produced when he was a graduate student and young PhD there. Okay, so that was how we do formant synthesis, how, how we did that um, parametric knowledge-based synthesis. Let's talk a little bit now about how we would do diphone synthesis. Now, a, a diphone, remember we were just talking about consonants and vowels. Well, a diphone is a unit of speech that goes from sort of the middle of one phoneme, like a consonant, to the middle of the subsequent phoneme, like a vowel. The nice thing about that as a unit of waveform concatenation is it includes the transition time from the steady state of one phoneme into the steady state of the next phoneme. So if you think of phonemes as having sort of a steady state in the middle and, and the vocal tract is moving between them, then by cutting out just the sections that capture the movement, you can, you can have a, basically all of your rules encapsulated in, in that 
piece of speech that you've stored. And all you have to do then is concatenate things that are steady states. So that's what we're trying to do with diphones. So let's say we actually wanted to produce the word diphone. Uh, we can start with this word here, which happens to be the word diagnose. And you'll notice that it has a silence at the beginning. That's what this zero, zero means. And then a D sound, and that's this little region right here. And then I, that's the die of diagnose. So what we could do is cut from that <coughs> silence to D, and then from D to the middle of I, and we have the die part. And then we need to find the I of, of diphone. So we could go to a word like alwife. And at the end of that word, I see an I followed by an F. So we could cut from the middle of that I to the middle of the subsequent F. And that would give us the second diphone that we need to say diphone. And then we could go, this word is bifocal. So it's got the fo sound that you need for diphone. And we can cut a diphone out of that and so forth. I won't bother you to go through all of these to get to the end. But I, I did do that just for fun. And um, so here's a, here's a waveform that was generated by cutting out the diphones. Uh, silence to D, D to I, I to F, F to O, O to N, N to S, and so forth, to say diphone synthesis. And here's what it sounds like. Diphone synthesis. Pretty bad, right? <laughs> well, if I spent a lot of time cutting those diphones really carefully, I could make it sound a lot better than that, but it still has a lot of limitations. And, the primary limitation being that in the original form of diphone synthesis, you were allowed exactly one diphone for every possible diphone combination. That meant that you could, you could build an entire English language synthesizer with about 2,400 to 3,000 diphone units, every one being unique. And then just pick the right ones that you need and paste them together and you've got, um, you've got a diphone synthesizer. Um, and in the 1970s and early 80s, that was kind of what the computer technology was going to be able to support in terms of the amount of storage that was required to store that speech and the amount of computer power that was needed to manipulate the storage and paste it together and then play it out. But computers have gotten better. And so in the 80s and 90s, we started doing a sort of an advanced form of diphone synthesis called unit selection synthesis. And in unit selection synthesis, uh, well, an, an easy distinction or an easy way to think of it is branching out from diphone synthesis by taking, instead of having just one example of each possible diphone, we have many, many examples of each possible diphone, but drawn from different contexts. So we might have that I, die phone, uh, the die, uh, die phone pulled from the beginning of an utterance or something from the middle of an utterance or something at the end of an utterance. Uh, we might have an example where the talker was stressing the word and another example where the talker was de-stressing the syllable that had the die in it. So all these different combinations allow you to reproduce speech that sounds much better. And the main challenge then is, well, storage space because now instead of storing 2400, you're storing hundreds of thousands of these units, potentially. And then the other problem is, how do you search that space, which is now in a really big search space, and find the units that you need in a principled fashion? And uh, that's where a technology called a Viterbi search comes in. <coughs> um, people who've worked with hidden Markov models are probably very familiar with Viterbi searches. They're, they're a way to find the best possible path through a set of states given uh, a combination of costs. The costs are typically join costs and uh, um, uh, target costs or unit costs. So here's an example uh, where we're trying to synthesize the word two, and we're just using, uh, again, diphones, or actually half phonemes in this case. So we have a single phoneme or silence at the beginning of an utterance. And then we have the first half of a T, and then we have the second half of a T, and there's two of these. And then we've got an oo sound, and we've got three different examples of oo. And then using the Viterbi search, 
we searched through this space to find the combination of first and second halves of each of those phones that's going to blend together, producing the least amount of distortion by some measure of distortion. And when we do that, we can end up with a synthesizer that sounds a little bit more like this. Oops. This is a unit selection voice. So that, that's a voice that uh, that's from a child in, in my lab. And you can see that now we're actually, you can probably hear a little bit of glitching in it, but it's now beginning to sound a lot like a, a human speaking rather than um, rather than a collection of uh, bits and pieces. So the last uh, the last form of synthesis that I want to sort of brush over kind of briefly is is uh, what's really called statistical parametric synthesis. That's where we now, now are now using machine learning to actually uh, learn the the, uh, the trajectories of parameters rather than the, to find units in the speech. Um, so what we start out with is actually a process that works kind of the same way that, that we now find units for unit selection synthesis. And that is we align a set of hidden Markov models, basically a set of speech recognition models, <laughs> to some recordings of speech. And then we retrain those models to, to uh, optimally fit an individual talker's speech. Now, from that, we can either use the states that we've identified through the, the um, uh, forced alignment of the hidden Markov models uh, as the bits of waveform that we concatenate in a unit selection system or we can look at the parameters that are associated with each of those and then synthesize speech by going directly from the parameters, skipping the, the problem of storing the speech entirely. Um, so that has some obvious advantages in, in its compactness and the, the fact that you're no longer having to concatenate waveforms and you can now control that parameter base in a, in a better way. But it also has a few downsides. Um, one of them being that the uh, the talker's identity isn't conveyed as well by this because the the extra amount of signal processing that you have to use sort of removes some of the the naturalness from the voice um, and it sounds a lot flat um, so basically having the parameters even in a in a system that's learned to use them you don't necessarily know what to do with them as well as you could and that's especially the case if you want to start generating expressiveness like uh, you know, three different ways to say no that mean yes, no, and maybe. Um, let me just play some examples now of the things that we've talked about here. Um, this deck talk is sort of the original system that was designed by Dennis Klatt that I mentioned. It's a, a parametric knowledge-based system. Frank the happy animal from a shoe. How many of you understood what that just said? <laughs> Uh, here's the same sentence spoken by uh, a unit selection system. Drag the happy animal from the shoe. And here's the same uh, voice, uh, the same sentence now spoken by uh, a parametric statistical synthesizer. Drag the happy animal from the shoe. And you can you can probably tell the similarity in the voices between those two. Uh, when you're listening with earphones, you can hear some differences as well due to the signal processing. Um, so this is the direction that the field is moving in. We don't have any mainline synthesizers actually available that are using uh, statistical parametric synthesis yet, but that's the direction that all of the labs, including mine, are actually going in. So now I want to shift gears a little bit more and tell you just briefly about the model talker synthesizer system, which is the one that my lab developed starting about a decade ago, actually, um, as a system specifically for kids who are going to be, and adults who are going to be using um, their own voice in a speech, in a uh, communication speech generating device. Um, what we set out to do was design a, a system that was sufficiently fast and accurate that we could get somebody to record their own speech, maybe even in their home, and uh, run it through a more or less automatic process and turn out the other end a usable speech synthesizer that sounded like the person uh, who recorded the speech originally. So the, the system that we developed has, um, for instance, this is the software that might run on a user's uh, Windows system at home. 
that guides them through the sequence of recording a set of sentences. It tells them what sentence to record. Um, it presents the set, plays the sentence for them so they know what it's supposed to sound like. Uh, lets them then click a record button uh, right here, uh, record the sentence, click a stop button, and uh, then it measures how well that sentence met our expectations in terms of its volume, pitch, and pronunciation. And if it scores well on all those dimensions, then they move on to the next sentence, and they do that uh, for 1,600 sentences or so. So that amounts to about an hour of, of actual running speech if you pasted all those 1,600 sentences together. Uh, we also now have a, a web-based system that people can go to a particular website, and uh, this implements about the same process in a in a way that can be uh, operated on from the Chrome web browser. Um, just to describe the system in a slightly different sense, what we have is a control file that's telling the programs and consequently the user what to record <coughs> and when to record it. Um, a recording system that does the actual recording that generates a set of speech files. Those speech files then run through a process that extracts features, fits hidden Markov models to the speech, uh, so on, finds the data that look good, throws out the data that look questionable, that we're not sure what they are, and then builds a database of units for unit selection synthesis. Um, that synthesis database, along with a dictionary and a set of, of rules for prosodic features, uh, are combined and used by a synthesis system <coughs> that is then able to produce speech. Uh, and here's an example of what that could sound like. This is a demonstration of the Model Talk, a speech synthesis system. That happened to be a, a British guy who recorded the, the sentences. And, uh, and lo and behold, out comes British speech. <laughs> um, so we've been providing Model Talker voices for ALS patients now for some time. And they can, we've probably <coughs> done over 600 voices of for ALS patients. Uh, we try to get them to record their speech while they're still speaking very fluently before they have uh, uh, a lot of dysarthria or other problems with breath control. If they do that, we are generally able to make a voice that, that always sounds like the user, uh, usually sounds good enough to actually be a mainline synthesizer on their communication device and they're then able to preserve their own personal voice in their communication device when they're no longer able uh, as the disease progresses. Um, we've also occasionally made voices for people who have, uh, are expecting to have uh, surgery of some sort that's going to leave them. Um, um, but the, the challenges with this kind of synthesis are fairly obvious. That hour of running speech, the 1,600 sentences, is, is a hard job for anybody to do. A really good, fluent, practiced speaker probably needs four or five hours of real time to record those 1,600 sentences uh, because of the time that they spend uh, between sentences and sometimes going back and correcting sentences if they made a mistake and so forth. So there's a lot of work involved in it. Um, as a task, it's also very, very challenging for children. We, we really have a difficult time finding kids who are young enough to sound like you're, you know, really good young child voices who are also good enough readers and good enough at articulation and, frankly, understand the task well enough to actually sit down and do this and record a voice that's usable. So we found a few, but, but it's difficult for children, and we just as soon not have to ask them to do that much work to, to generate a voice. Um, obviously, if you're already dysarthric, this, this process is a non-starter. So corpus size is what we're looking at as the thing that we need to reduce. And what we would love to be able to reduce it down to is just, say, be able to capture a vowel or a couple of vowels and some consonants from someone. Actually, we don't need the consonants, just the vowels. Literally, your vocal identity is conveyed almost entirely by the louder vowel sounds of your speech. Uh, a colleague of mine, Susan Hertz, ran a really neat study where she took uh, vowels and, from a child and all the consonants from an adult recording the same passage and pasted them together, and you could not tell that there was any adult speech in there as long as she had all the right vowel speech in the, in the other. So, 
we know that if we just focus on the vowels, we can come up with a set of standard consonants and use those everywhere. Um, but we need to uh, we need to work on how to do that. And uh, I think I've pretty much just said everything that's on this slide, so I'm going to move immediately to the next one and talk a little bit about the first effort that we had, and this was in conjunction with a colleague, uh, Rupal Patel, at Northeastern University, uh, where we set about a, a process that uh, she was referring to as vocality at the time. Um, and what we were trying to do was get a complete inventory of speech from a donor who was uh, articulate. And some example of phonation from a dysarthric child, and then grab what we could of the identity of the dysarthric child and impose it on the speech of the fluent donor. Um, and I, I need to be careful if there's speech language pathologists in the room using fluent here. I just mean that they speak well. Um, but um, the the first thing that we tried was, especially with people with speakers who are very dysarthric. Uh, no one has ever heard them actually speak, so about the only thing that we get out of them is, is what the sound of their, their source function is. And, and so perhaps if we just captured the source function and sort of swapped source functions in this speech, we would be able to come up with something that sounded like, um, like or at least more like, the individual filter. So just reminding <coughs> you of the source filter theory that we talked about a minute ago, if you have the source and a vocal tract and you drive that source through the vocal tract, you end up with speech. What we're going to do now is something where we can take the, um, um, the vocal tract and the source information from our donor and from our dysarthric <coughs> and split them apart, invert that, uh, that original filter or deconvolve it, as, as technically speaking. And, then be able to generate um, utterances by blending them in different ways. So here's an example of the very first child that we did in my lab. Um, this is that child producing an uh sound. And it's, it's, we don't really know what she was intending to say. It's just sort of a diffuse open vocal tract sound. And here's a sound from the donor talker. It has a more clearly defined awe kind of quality. What we can do is take the, the, uh, the source from this talker, which now just sounds like a buzz uh, without phonetic quality, and the source from this talker which also sounds like a buzz without phonetic quality. And we can kind of blend them together. Now we're, what we have here in the middle is a spectrum that has the vocal tract structure from our articulate talker and the source function from our dysarthric talker and combines the two. So it no longer sounds exactly like the original vowel. It now has the, the source characteristics of the dysarthric talker. So we can apply this process to the whole inventory of speech recorded by the, the donor talker and then generate a, from that um, a set of sentences that represent what the donor talker's source function or what the target talker's source function, the dysarthric child's source function would sound like if it was driven through the articulate talker's vocal tract. And here's an example of one sort of sentence. I'll have a new ribbon for my hair. That's the original donor talker. And here's the converted speech. I'll have a new ribbon for my uh, So it's got a little bit of distortion in it from the signal processing that we're using, uh, but it also has uh, recognizably some of the source characteristics of the original talker. Um, so in uh, a few minutes' time, what I'd like to do is just give you a quick rundown on a few um, kids that we've done in the lab so far using processes like this. Um, we, we've actually applied it to about six kids at this point. We have three more waiting in the wings. Um, we're uh, looking for kids who are in ages between 8 and 17, or the ones we've done so far are in that age range. 
And uh, the pictures and audio that I'm showing you in the following slides were okayed by the parents and the, and the participants themselves. Um, so this is uh, one young lady named Haley. And she's the one we've actually been listening to. Uh, I shall have a new ribbon for my hair. And this is a sentence finally, that's actually synthesized from the, the speech synthesizer that we built by un doing unit selection on those sentences that we converted. My grandfather. You wish to know all about my grandfather. Well, he is nearly 93 years old. <coughs> and it goes on for a while, but we won't play. Another example of a young lady in our lab, um, Shannon, who had uh, higher pitch and her voice was a little bit less breath than Haley's, uh, than, uh, also a cerebral palsy uh, patient. Here's an example of her vowel. Uh. We used as the original uh, vowel. And a converted sentence from the donor talker. He was much disappointed in that passage of, in her synthetic voice. My grandfather. I wish to know all about my grandfather. Well, he is nearly 93 years old. And you can hear that there's a there's distortion that enters into it from all of the signal processing that we've had to go through to get here. Um, but it, it is a voice that uh, Shannon is able to use as a communication device that doesn't sound like the voice of anyone else in her uh, classroom. So she's She's pretty happy with that. The, the last example I'll give you is from a young lady that, uh, that we did from Rubel Patel's lab, uh, although the processing was done in mind. Um, this is a, a young lady with an unusual disease, Perry Sylvan disorder. Uh, she was able to produce a few syllables as well as some much clearer sounding vowels. And she has perfectly fine uh, motor skills, except that she really can't talk. Uh, so we were able to, to generate get a vowel from her, first of all. Uh, it sounded uh, like a fairly natural ah uh, vowel. And uh, we used a, a donor who was uh, a young adult, uh, but a, you know just a few years older than Shannon was at the time. Or uh, Samantha. The voyage was our idea of a good time. So that's the uh, the donor's speech with Shannon's uh, vocal track or uh, phonation attached to it. And here's her uh, grandfather passing. My grandfather. You wish to know all about my grandfather. Well, he is nearly 93 years old. <coughs> now, you can hear in that also a couple of the other faults of unit selection. Um, because we're literally just taking bits and pieces of recorded speech and pasting them together, if the fundamental frequency doesn't match well between the pitch of the, the speech doesn't match well from one unit to the next, you hear some of the, the discontinuities that we heard in that. So that's, that's a challenge, but then as soon as you start trying to apply um, uh, processing to the speech to reduce the discontinuity, what happens is you end up distorting the voice still further, and it sounds less and less like any individual human being, and more and more like Stephen Hawking. So we're always running this trade-off, if you will, between processing the speech to make it sound very smooth, and uh, having the speech sound as much like the voice quality of the original talker or the target talker as we can. Um, so looking ahead, that's really what we what we want to try and do is improve the audio quality of the voice conversion process so that it doesn't sound quite as grainy or whatever that that sound harsh. Um, we want to, in the examples that I've played you so far, the only information from the target talker that we've used is the source function, but we're actually starting to generate now voices where we use a little bit of the vocal tract information as well. What we're doing is modifying the the donors. Uh, vocal tract length in the process so that it corresponds if the donor was a larger person will shorten their vocal tract algorithmically um, and if the donor was a smaller person will lengthen their vocal tract to make it sound more like it would the speech would have come from the vocal tract of the target talker um, 
and I think the way that we're going to end up doing this, and the reason that we're concentrating so much on parametric synthesis now in my lab, is is that we're going to be able to going to need to use parametric synthesis from beginning to end. Um, we are in the midst of a study right now where we're trying to recruit 20 patients with cerebral palsy. This is an <coughs> uh, We're looking for kids between nine and 20, but still in high school. Um, they should be uh, active and effective users of a speech generating device. And um, we would like them to have a language understanding at least within two years of a typically developing peer. Uh, so if, if the typically developing child graduates from high school at 18, uh, we could have a, a cerebral palsy child graduating from high school at 20. So. The way the study is, is working is we're um, um, on visit one, we're recording that vowel or whatever else we can get from the target talker to try and capture as much of the vocal tract information as possible. Um, and then uh, giving them a sort of generic voice, but it's one that has some language activity monitoring built into it. So that over the course of a three month period, we can actually measure uh, things like word frequency, and uh, the length of utterance and a few other statistics like that. We are, we are not, by, on purpose, we are not recording whole sentences and, and able to parse them, but we do get word frequency. Um, during that three month period, we're also uh, locating a donor talker, using that donor talker's speech to change the, uh, the target talker's information into a synthetic voice. And then on visit two, we give the uh, the, the participant, a new voice that's their own personal voice, hopefully sounding like they would sound if they were speaking uh, more, um, more fluently. Um, we often try to find donors who are from the same region <coughs> so that the, the voice quality really is likely to be a good match for what this person would sound like if they were. Um, if they were. Um, and we ask them to then use the synthesizer only that synthesizer for three months so that we can measure their, their behavior, again, using language activity monitoring over that three-month period. And then in the final six-month period of the study, uh, we allow them to use any synthesizer they want, and we're still recording some statistics when they use the speech synthesizer, but we also get to tell them how frequently they use that synthesizer versus another synthesizer. And um, also at each of those uh, visit points, we collect uh, some survey information from the parents or caregiver on, the, on their perception of how the child is doing in their language development and, and SGD. So I just want to um, acknowledge uh, some of the, the, the current team that I'm working with at Nemours. Dr. Linda Bellino is the uh, speech language pathologist in the group. Jason Lilly is a PhD computational linguist who's uh, helping us a lot with the uh, with the speech synthesis work. Martha B. Ratnagiri is a PhD in electrical engineering. She's a postdoc in my lab and uh, helping us with the signal processing. Katie McGrath is our research assistant and Bill Moyers is the person who's done the, the lion's share of the actual program development for us. The coding the, the systems. Previously, I, I want to uh, sort of shout out to Stephen Hawk or Stephen Hoskins, not to be confused, with the guy, um, who now works for one of those speech synthesis companies that I that I mentioned. Um, Deborah Yarrington, who's now a professor in computer science at the University of Delaware, and who was uh, uh, instrumental in some of the early forms of uh, speech synthesis. Jim Polakoff was a research associate in my lab for for years who uh, did a, an enormous amount of work on on the uh, system, as has Chris Pennington. And uh, I need to mention Rupa Patel and Timothy Mills from Northeastern, who collaborated on some of the, the uh, three case studies. That I did. And with that, I, I will end with this. Thank you for your time and attention. That's, that's the daughter of uh, my postdoc, Madhubi, and she was kind enough to donate a synthetic voice. That's her synthetic voice that you just heard. Thank you. Are there any questions?
Is there a way to contact you for finding pediatric clients? Is, is you have a, uh, an email? Is there some way for actual potential? <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty easy to find. Okay. <laughs> it's just my, my I, it may even be on the handouts. I don't know. It's my last name in the no worst problem. Problem. Any plans for research on adults? Well, we've been doing the ALS work for okay. years, and um, one of the things that what most of those, we probably have in excess of a thousand voices. Uh, not all of which are from ALS patients, but people who visit our website or use that work web recorder typically allow us to keep and use copies of their speech in our research. So we have uh, terabytes of, of speech data from uh, people who've donated their voices that way, and we do use that routinely in our, <coughs> in our research. <coughs> As the children, the patients become adults, and their synthesized voice. Yeah, we would. That's definitely on our roadmap of, of, of things for the future, especially parametric synthesis. Is how can we take that that voice and grow it? We can lengthen the vocal tract. We can lower the pitch of the of the vocal cords a little bit, and we can you know we can do a few things that will will get us there. Um. How are you accounting for sort of vowel shifts with accents and uh, second language learners and even uh, anything other than standard American English? Great question. We, we were so worried that, you know, we have one dictionary and one set of recordings and everybody records the same thing. And I have really been just amazed at the extent to which the majority of the phenomena that you're talking about actually are captured by the inventories and come right back at you when you play the synthetic speech. That British talker that I played is the same rule system, the same dictionary that we use for our American English speakers, and yet it comes out sounding just like that. Routinely, we, we do people from, in fact, right now I'd say that we're probably getting more adult ALS MND patients from the UK than we are from the US. Hmm. Uh, we're also getting a lot of uh, people from Australia and New Zealand. Uh, bolts coming through, lots of ways. Uh, and the, the accents come through. I understand your focus is right now with cerebral palsy, and therefore, a lot of times, this requirement of like a two year receptive delay in language is. Um, a reasonable, you know, you can find that. But for so many of other um, um, issues going on with, with children that probably do not have that situation, is there kind of an in-between? So, we, you know, you, you, I understand for research purposes, but for families out there who are kind of more, whether the child has autism or, or um, more of a situation where that, that's going to be a concern. Is there a middle ground right now for families to kind of at least get something instead of sounding like Stephen Hawkins or? Yeah, yeah there absolutely, or there certainly is in our lab. Okay. Um, the, the study, to be in that particular study, you have to have several pulses. Sure, sure. Um, however, Mira's voice, for instance, right. was actually recorded for a child who's autistic. And who has some limited speech, but whose uh, primary communications communication. Other questions? Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. Thank you.